At the top of page 11, we were talking about the whole question of variety, flexibility, pluriformity, which is another aspect of this whole matter of alternation. That it's not just a, a boring matter of God always inspires in us the same response, but God's work in, in us and for us produces different results at different times. And, and so in this text in, in 69.6, Bernard's saying, well, there are a number of ways in which we can tell that the bridegroom is, is working for us. Uh, a number of different effects. So, we've got a volunteer, somebody like to, to read this for me? Roger, would you? I have no doubt that the bridegroom is present whenever I receive some insight into the scriptures, whenever a word of wisdom wells up within me, whenever light pours down on me from above, unveiling mysteries, whenever heaven's most ample lap overflows to fill my soul with an abundant shower of lofty thoughts. These ample measures belong to the word, and it is from his fullness that we have received them. And if it should happen at the same time that he pours into my heart a rich but humble devotion, by which the love of the perceived truth generates in me a necessary hatred and contempt of vanity, lest knowledge inflate me and I am lifted up by the frequency of his visits, then I recognize that he is acting toward me in a fatherly manner. So I am then sure that the Father also is present. So we have here given to us a number of ways in which the action of God, the visitation of the Word, can be diagnosed, can be known. First of all, some insight into the Scriptures. It's very, very worthwhile just to, to look at these in some detail. What does that mean? That Whenever I'm reading the scriptures and, and, and some part of that scripture seems to come alive for me, when I see myself mirrored in the scriptures, then what, what uh, Bernard is saying is that this is the action of the word on me reaching out, as it were, to embrace the word contained in scriptures. Whenever a word of wisdom wells up within me, something coming from the depths of my own heart, this is again the action of God's Word. Whenever light pours down on me from above, unveiling mysteries, spiritual insight, uh, a spiritual uh, wisdom that, that gives me a taste for, 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 for unseen realities. Whenever heaven's most ample lap overflows to fill my soul with an abundant shower of lofty thoughts. Most of us are naturally carnal those of us who have bodies at any rate. And so our thoughts are carnal. We think about food, we get excited about a big meal, uh, we like to go to movies, we like um, sleep-ins and all that kind of thing. And our natural thoughts are at that level. And it's pretty, it's pretty unnatural in one sense, it's pretty unusual for us to have spiritual thoughts, thoughts of God and so forth. And we don't generate these things of ourselves because we don't have the equipment. And it's only when the Word of God is active in us that we begin to turn our mind to, to spiritual things, or not so much to turn our mind to spiritual things, but we find ourselves already captivated and entranced by spiritual things. Whenever heaven's most ample lap overflows to fill my soul with an abundant shower of lofty thoughts, they're the positive things, but the other things just exactly the same. A rich but humble devotion. Occasionally we may experience a spurt of fervour. 
we may, may suddenly, for so, no apparent reason, find that we have a little more energy than we normally do. A normal low level of energy is suddenly decreased a little, and we just find that we have just a tiny attraction towards prayer, a tiny attraction towards reconciliation, a tiny attraction towards the office or, or some other thing, that it's not there usually. Of course, a lot depends what we do with it, whether we follow it or whether we just say, oh, hello, stranger, I haven't seen you for a long time, and that's about it. But when we find these things in our hearts, then they're the gift of the Word. That's God acting upon us. And a lot will depend on whether we're prepared to go with that action. A rich but humble devotion. It's not the kind of Hollywood devotion that you can put on the screen and feel real good about and tell everybody about, but something which just quietly and humble, humbly takes you nearer to things that are good and to things that are God. By which the love of the perceived truth generates in me a necessary hatred and contempt of vanity. Lest no knowledge inflate me, and I am lifted up by the frequency of his visits, then I recognize that he is acting towards me in a fatherly manner. If it is true that God acts variously within the life of a single individual, it's also true that different individuals reflect different aspects of the divine action. It's the next step in the argument. Each has his own spiritual physiognomy. Each finds his secret with the bridegroom. So we're not all production line models. We don't just be turned out from the Cistercian uh, spiritual factory all stamped ident uh, identically, but rather we each are fairly unique and at any moment in a community we each have our own specific gift and call and challenge. And the only way that a community goes forward is when each in the community uh, finds that, that specific call and responds to it. So he says, we do not all run in the same way. Different devotion, so to speak, different approaches to spirituality. You will see some who burn vehemently in the pursuit of wisdom. For Bernard, that's a very pure type of, of spirituality, uh, hungering, thirsting, burning, ardently desiring wisdom, ardently desiring a, a taste for spiritual things, and never really being able to be satisfied with anything else, uh, and constantly looking for the, for the spiritual. Um, you do find that occasionally in, in most unusual people. I mean, it's not something they generate by themselves, but from time to time, and I'd say in the order, <laughs> you meet people that you could describe that way, who burn vehemently in the pursuit of wisdom. They don't necessarily, you know, deserve to, <laughs> but they have a very, it's an innate quest for wisdom, is, 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 is a very uh, inherent part of their own personality, not only their spiritual approach, but, but they wouldn't be themselves without it. So that's for some. Others who are more animated in the direction of penitence. Well, some it's the carrot and others it's the stick. <laughs> penitence in the sense that they recognize very clearly what their past life was all about. They recognize clearly the role of sin in their life and, and say, well, for me to get anywhere, I better, I better allow myself to, to come under the discipline of penance so that uh, I don't destroy myself. And a lot of the kind of classical Trappist um, spiritual models were, were like that. You know, here is Brother X who, who lived a rotten life for 92 years before entering La Trap, and uh, then in three months wept his eyes out and went to heaven. And uh, that was kind of held out as a great model, and if you, you hadn't qualified uh, for that sort of life, you felt that you should leave the monastery and, and go and commit a few sins that you'd have something to regret. But um, it's, it's not quite the purpose of the thing. It's rather that it's the gift of some, uh, that they're given intensity more by, by great bitterness and regret at the sense of their own wasted lives than by any, um, you might say, more uh, uh, direct desire for the things of God. It's more implicit who are more animated in the direction of penitence and the hope of pardon. 
others again who are led through good example towards the practice of virtue. So there are people who are fairly simple and nothing much seems to go on inside their lives, uh, in a sense. They don't really uh, desire to be autonomous people, but are happy to be led by good example. And we see this always in, in the case of the saints. Aldous Huxley says somewhere that saints generally come in clusters. You get one central figure and around that figure you get all sorts of satellites glued to them and who are simply become good by modelling themselves or by, by being attracted by virtue as it is embodied in the life of a particular individual. And it will always be so, I think, in our monasteries that there will be some people who won't have a whole lot of spiritual insight themselves but will go to God simply by keep clinging to the coattails of other members of the community or the members of the, of the community as a whole or by some saint or something like that. I just want to be like St Bernard or something like that. Um, others who are led through good example towards the practice of virtue and others again who are inflamed to piety by the memory of the passion. Now he's not giving an exhausted list there, but just saying there are people with radically different spiritualities in our communities. Talk about Cistercian spirituality, well it means that there are many of them. And if it's good for you, if it's something that helps you to grow, if it's something that builds itself realistically on what you are and what you have become, then that's good Cistercian spirituality. If it means standing on your head and singing hallelujah, uh, if that's a, that's a real thing that helps you to grow, well, it's as Cistercian as anything else. Because um, if you're a Cistercian and that helps you to grow, then it becomes Cistercian by association with you. There's no kind of book, you know, we'll look up Cistercian spirituality in the book, you know, go to see a spiritual director, ah, yes, Cistercian spirituality is it? Oh, yes, this is what you have to do. But rather, the spirituality that, that he's talking about is something that grows from what we are and corresponds to the specific call of grace that we are. And so can't be just picked out of a card index and say, this is the next step. But it's always something that builds on what I am. So within the unity of the monastery, this leads ideally to different vocations, all equally to, to, to be cherished. Bernard here records a conviction common in monastic tradition, for example, in John Cashin and Pseudo Macarius. A couple of terrific texts there, Cashin Conference 14.4, if I remember correctly, talking about the ways of perfection. Uh, even, even somebody like Evagrius, the, the patron saint of the one-track mind, uh, has texts that kind of support this idea, that when you get people living together, it's not as, uh, as imitators of one another, but it's rather that if each is being faithful, then you get a variety of flowers in the garden. pseudo Macarius in that tradition also. And this is one of my favourite texts. You find it all over the place. Um, I nearly know it off by heart. It's from De Diversis 42.4, a very famous sermon of Bernard's. So, even if you, if you didn't know otherwise, the monastery is truly a paradise. A region fortified with the ramparts of discipline. It's a glorious thing to have men living together in the same house, following the same way of life. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers live in unity. Now, so everybody's doing the same thing, right? He says it's all following the same rule, the same way of life. Well, let's ha hear how they're doing the same form of uh, same thing. You could almost go around the community and, and, and say, we could probably go around the group. See, take somebody like Guy, whose spirituality is mainly weeping for his sins. Um, another rejoicing in the praise of God. Kate, she does that. Another tending to the needs of all is Andre. Another giving instructions to the rest is, is no, we're going backwards to Roger. <laughs> Come back. See, you could just look at your own community and put faces on these names. Here is one who's weeping for his son sins, another rejoicing in the praise of God, another tending the needs of all, and another giving instruction to the rest. Here is one who is at prayer, and another who is at reading, 
Here is one who is compassionate. And who is this one? Uh, who has the gift of inflicting penalties for sins. So if anybody does anything, anything wrong, you can ex expect good old Brother Colerick to step out and, and let everybody know that this is not appropriate behaviour in a monastery. This one is aflame with love. That one is valiant in humility. This one remains humble when everything goes well. And this one does not lose ha his nerve in difficulties. In other words, nothing goes well with this one. But he, he, yet he doesn't lose his nerve. He still keeps struggling on, and that's his gift. This one works very hard in active tasks, and the other finds quiet in the practice of contemplation. Now, there are two things that we could say about this text. First, it's the ancient, if you've studied the ancient philosophy at all, you'd know that unity isn't just two divided by one. You know, for us, one is just less than two and less than three. You have three ones in, 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 in three and so forth. And we have a very reductionist view of what unity is all about. You know, the best way of achieving unity in a community is the machine gun. You just shoot everybody else and then we've got unity. Now, the ancients wouldn't have believed that because for them, unity exists not by kicking everybody else out, but by the more the merrier. And the more differences that could be reconciled and embraced, the richer was that unity. So it was an inclusive unity, not an exclusive unity. It's a unity that embraced differences and flourished on differences and jumped up and down and got excited about differences, not something that blew the whistle and said, everybody march in time. Uh, and, and when we read ancient philosophic texts on unity, for example, uh, the scholastic notion of unity is one of the transcendental qualities of being, that we have to understand that this is what they meant. Not a reductionist idea, whereby variety is denied and everything is reduced to the lowest common denom de de denominator, but rather a very, the post perfect unity is God, who reconciles in himself all the differences. It's, they said about Cleopatra, vilest things become themselves in her. You know, that type of idea that even the contradicencia oppositorum, God is able to reconcile opposites. That's how powerful his unity is, that opposites are reconciled within it. It's so broad and so all-embracing that nothing is excluded. That's the unity of God. The unity of God's people on earth, the community, is, uh, uh, in case you didn't know, is the Catholic Church, and small c Catholic, which means nobody is excluded. Outside the church there is no salvation because you can't get outside the church. There is nobody who is uh, excluded, per se, from the church. It, it's Catholicos. It's, it's, it embraces anything. Whatever is, is embraced in its unity. And, uh, and it's exactly the same with the community. We've cheapened the idea of unity in the community to a Nuremberg model. Everybody get in line, get your banners up, march in step, uh, you know, left, right, left, right, and so forth. And that's good, uniform community. And uh, there are no aberrations here, and the abbot visitor checks them all off. But rather, it's the opposite of that. A good community Im involves just so many different gifts. And there's an anthropology at the bottom of this, which we'll come back to in a minute. That's one thing, all these various th things. And the second thing, if we look at that text from Cashin, which I, didn't, I don't have with me, is that not only do everybody do all these various things, but they actually enjoy it. And they do it feelingfully. They enjoy, they gain a sort of pleasure from doing the sort of things which are their own. So that the one who, who, who weeps for his sins, I suppose, gains a perverse enjoyment, but he feels that this is the right thing to do. Others who serve gave, gain pleasure by that service. Others who teach, teach with, gain a certain pleasure from that. Those who read and who love to be uh, to love to pray or love to read or whatever it is, it's not because, because it uh, is something that causes them pain, but it's something in which they, they feel greatly at peace. They feel attracted to this. They feel drawn to this. And so many of the things in, in, um, in monastic exhortations to prayer or reading are to love prayer, to give oneself to prayer, to throw oneself into prayer to have a certain enthusiasm, but it's not just a dull, 
uh, material observance of a commandment or a regulation, but really having a desire for prayer or, or really wanting the opportunity to sit down and cry about one's sins or whatever it is. So this is the notion of a community. The unity of the church, the unity of the community is, is, is one which embraces and includes all sorts of variety, not one which is reduced to uh, the tyrannical reduction of all uh, singularity uh, so that you get just a single species of monk. And it's relatively easy to do if you're sufficiently terrifying, but it means chopping, chopping bits off everybody. I mean, to make everybody fit into the one chair, it's a bit like Cinderella's sister. You've got to chop off a toe and so forth. You've got to fit them all so that everybody is the same. And as a result, nobody is what they are naturally. The picture of the monastery which emerges from this is far from the stereotyped regimentation of uniform observance. It reminds one of Starina Gerardo's painting, The Thabayad, in which no worthwhile Christian task is left undone. So for Thursday we've planned a trip to Florence. Um, we hope your abbots and abbesses won't mind. Um, and we're going to go to the, the Uffizi Gallery and look at uh, Starina Gerardo's uh, painting, but it's a nice big long painting. But it's a very cute little thing because it's got all, the, it's covered with tiny little vignettes of monks and monks doing all sorts of strange things. And no good work is being neglected. So uh, what you do here is one who is at prayer, another who is at top of the mountain talking with the angel, another helping a, a widow across the stream, uh, somebody else burying the dead. Uh, a lot of the good ones are dressed like Cistercians, I notice. One of them is hearing a Benedictine's confession, <laughs> which seems to be a bit of a jab somewhere or other, but all sorts of little things. And I think this is the kind of notion that we need to have of a monastery, that it's a community of those who follow the gospel. And because it's a community of those who follow the gospel, the community as a whole should embody every gift that is uh, proper to the church as a whole. All that we read about the New Testament, about the church, should be found more or less in the monastery, because a monastery is a little church, an ecclesia, ecclesia. And so, uh, the, you might say the anthropological basis of this is that as individuals we can't hope to have all gifts, as Basil says in that, that uh, number seven of the Long Rules. As individuals we can't hope to have all gifts, but by living in a community, then we can participate in the gifts of others. And as a community, we can exercise all gifts. I can be there weeping for my sins, rejoicing in the praise of God, tending the needs of all, giving instruction, praying, reading, being compassionate, uh, thundering about abuses, and so forth. All these various qualities of the community I can do uh, if I really identify with the community. I don't have to take it upon myself every virtue. Just in the same way as I don't have to milk cows to be able to live off the profits. <laughs> um, somebody else does that, and they don't have to do the sort of things that I do, uh, because I do that for them. But on a spiritual level, we're not obligated to have every possible virtue. Phew, I don't. <laughs> you know, we don't have to, but we just have to be faithful to what we ourselves are, to put in our part to the community. And uh, uh, otherwise we'd just go bonkers. Otherwise we'd go crazy trying to keep up with everybody else. But we, 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 we live as a community and within the unity of that community we can lay claim to, to every gift. I mean, you might have a guy who's wonderful in the guest house, who really welcomes people and uh, welcomes the poor and, and, and is great as a confessor for those in trouble and so forth. Well, you don't have to have those skills for, for everybody, but it's good and it's Christian that a community has somebody like that. Like Jean Leclerc has this funny story. He wrote a little article for our newsletter in praise of roundness and refers to St. Bernard's view that in heaven, taking it from origin, in heaven everything will be perfectly spherical because that's the only shape that has no intrinsic limitation and that things on earth are as as perfect as they are approaching the, the perfect shape, which is spherical. 
And then he goes on to say, tell the story about the monk, this guy that used to regularly come to his monastery looking for confession. And once he came and his regular confessor was not there. And he didn't know anybody else in the community, but he said to the brother in the, in the guest house, but he said, listen, get me someone who's fat. <laughs> in the sense that probably he's got a gift for compassion, or we normally associate with fat people, kind of jolliness, understanding, ability to uh, enfold other people, rather than the strict, lean and hungry look, which may, may uh, uh, be rather severe. But what I'm saying is that it's there, we all have different gifts. And I remember Rembert Wickland saying that he, it was always his experience that uh, uh, when a monk died, that those who were the biggest rascals in the community, those who were the rogues and always making troubles, always had the biggest funerals. Because, you know, somehow or other there are a lot of people who, with whom you come to the guest house or something like that, with whom they could very closely identify and whom they were able to help spiritually through their own hard times in the community itself. Although we're not saying that's a model to aim at. But at the same time, there is, a, there is a natural kind of rhythm. The community does have gifts. And it may be very nice to be all strict observants and, and be able to go on television and all that kind of thing. As, as you know, here is a community of the strict observants that no knot is left untied and, and so forth. But at the same time, in the normal human run of things, often, uh, the informal, unofficial uh, actions that are done in the name of the community can sometimes do much good. And so what we're saying is that grace has different effects in us at different times, it has different effects in the community according to different individuals, and we should be careful that our model of community is not such that it forces everybody into a reg rigid stereotype. For the most part, we live a mixed life. That would break a lot of people's hearts, you know, who claim that we're contemplatives. But in fact, we have to clean our shoes, at least at Christmas and Easter. Uh, we have to do all sorts of other, uh, other jobs which are not strictly contemplative. Milking cows is not part of the contemplative life. Um, and so forth. So it's a mixed life, and we have to find time for prayer with not enough time for the tasks we do, and as a result, insufficient leisure. Um, ask any monk why he doesn't uh, pray more, and he'd say, well, if only I had more time, I certainly would. Give him more time, and it's the same story. Remember the Peter principle? Work expands to fill the time available. The more time available you have, the more you'll, you, you'll expand the work and the hobbies and the, the fooling around because you're just really a little bit frightened of that. That, that ample leisure that we're supposed to have. So that another aspect of alternation is that we have to be sufficiently detached from what we are present doing, presently doing, so that we are open to alternatives, if this seems preferable. Now, this is a pretty important thing, detachment from what we're doing, uh, detachment from the jobs that we are now in. In other words, it may be time to change. Uh, after 92 years as assistant sub-sacristan, it may be time to let somebody else in and tyrannise the community. Um, and so, but it's a very rare quality. I mean, honestly, we change abbots much more frequently than we change sacristans in the order. Uh, and it's relatively easy to get rid of an abbot. Um, it's much more difficult to change a sacristan. Um, or, you know, you could fill in your own job, but there are certain jobs that people cling to and cling to because they give them a bit of space and a bit of power and a bit of uh, somewhere to leave their laundry when they're, they're, uh, when they're en route between one place and another and so forth. So it's, it's, it's an important thing that if our life changes, then we have to be open to change. You know, after we've done 42 years of study, it should be just about enough. Um, we don't keep, have to keep going back to school for the rest of our lives. And so, on the one hand, it's, it's a question of, of detachment for ourselves, but on the other hand, it's openness to the, to the future. I remember hearing a provincial superior of an active religious order uh, saying that, you know, he didn't know what had happened to obedience now because if he wanted somebody like a novice master, 
uh, he had only people who were useless for nothing else to do because everybody else was signed up with contracts. They were teaching in universities, teaching in schools, various places, and they were all signed up for contracts for a certain number of years. And if he wanted somebody to do a job, well, unfortunately, I'd love to, but look, my contract says I've got to fulfill five years or I've got tenure somewhere and I don't want to lose it and so forth. And there is just this danger that uh, we close ourselves off to the creative possibilities of, of obedience. Uh, for many of us, um, if we think back on our own life and we think of some new change of direction which really was creative for us and perhaps helpful for other people, very often it came about through obedience. It wasn't our own idea that we cranked out of the old mill just, you know, a standard thing of what I'm going to do with my life, what sort of person I am. But somebody else came in and said, I think you should go here, I think you should take up this sort of thing, I think you'd be good at this. And we said, oh, no, I'd rather not. And he said, yes, well, I'd rather you did. Off you go. And all of a sudden, we get into a new scene, we become more... Uh, we, we develop new skills and new gifts and so forth, and we grow through the process, even though we didn't want to be there. But simply, as St. Bendix says, trusting in God and, and, and hoping for the best, uh, keeping yourself seatbelt fast and sort of thing. And, and that's the way that very often our growth takes. But if we're going to insist on our rights, and as soon as the abbot says, I wonder would you mind, you say, I'm writing to the abbot general. You know, there are ways of appealing about this. I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to be out of that, and so forth. No, plenty. Every monastery of the order, I'm sure, has a few like that. You can't get them out of a job. You carry out of them out of it in a coffin, but you won't get them out of that job. And, um, you know, they may not do the work. They'll be prepared to take somebody else to do the work for them, but they won't um, actually give up the stripe. And so... You know, what obedience involves in all this is if our life is changing, then we need to be open to agents of change. And the principal agent of change in a monastery is the abbot. Eh? He says, you know, I think time to go. Hmm? You've, done, you've done your work there. It's time to do something different. Hmm? Another aspect of alternation is that we have to be sufficiently detached from what we're presently doing so that we're open to alternatives. This not only on a general level, but also uh, as we go through the day working. Perhaps you might finish early today. You know, what are you going to do? Oh, well, you go back to your room, put up your feet and uh, turn on the television and uh, call for a double brandy and wait till Vespers. Um, I hear some of these Canadian monasteries are pretty decadent. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do you do when you have a few spare minutes extra? We're always saying we don't have enough time for prayer. I presume you are, at any rate. But what do you do when you happen to finish work a bit, bit earlier? Or when you're waiting around and something doesn't come and you have time on your, on your hands? What do you do? And if you tell me what you do, I'll soon be able to tell you where, where the direction of your life is. If you've got this tendency when there is three minutes spare, to just sort of take it for prayer, to drift towards prayer, then probably you're really living a contemplative life. But if the last thing in your mind, if you finish everything and you find you've got three minutes before the bell, bell to Vespers and you just dash off to read the paper or to do something else, well, it looks as though you don't have any interest in the life of prayer. You just force yourself. And it's what you do with your spare time that really tells me what sort of person you are. And this idea of being open to, to just building more prayer into our life, turning to God more often in our life, allowing ourselves to experience the attraction of God is an intrinsic part of living a life of desire. So we should seem open to alternatives. I could easily wrap things up here and take a few minutes uh, more for prayer or to do some reading or just quietly go through uh, what's troubling me or whatever it is. In this way, some sort of balance is achieved in a life between communal and solitary doings, between spiritual and material, between active and passive, between doing and letting be. St. Aylred uses alternatio in this sense, to make sure that you have all the essential components of our life in every day of our life, that there is always prayer and there is always charity and always so forth. 
But since, for the most part, active works have a tendency to look after themselves, I mean, you may say, well, I'll, today I'll pray, I don't think I'll go to work. After about ten minutes, the phone is ringing, there are people banging at your door, um, they eventually drag you off down to work because everybody is waiting for you to work, and, and you can't. So active tasks, if you don't do them, somebody persecutes you. But nobody persecutes you if you don't pray. Nobody persecutes you if you don't do your reading. The ceiling doesn't fall in. Nobody knows that you're just sitting there fanning yourself and looking out the window. Who knows? No difference. You go to Vespers and you don't have a, your nose doesn't grow like Pinocchio. Um, nobody can tell that you haven't, uh, haven't been saying your prayers or doing your reading. They may notice that you're a little bit distracted or a bit snappy or, or scowling around or whatever it is, but they can't say he hasn't been doing his reading. He hasn't been saying his prayers. And, you know, you look around a choir, judging everybody else, and you say, you know, what is it that helps us to, 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 to uh, be able to find prayer in the office as distinct from just a performance? And it's really the extent to which we've found prayer in our daily life. And so active works, even the active work of liturgy, they tend to look after themselves. If you've got to sing a cantata for Christmas, well, you've got to prepare for it or an exultate at Easter, um, you don't just bowl into the church and say, where do I find it, which book is it in? Uh, because uh, you'd sing it badly and then you'd be shamed. But because it's out front, you've got to prepare it, you've got to know which book it is and where, where you begin and where you end and so forth. So active tasks look after themselves. But who looks after invisible uh, tasks? You know, things like reading, things like prayer, things like taking time to process our life. Who looks after those things? We can get along without them because nobody notices it. But the build-up within us, if we, if we don't do them, can sometimes cause our defeat. Active works have a tendency to look after themselves and are adept at seizing both our time and attention. So we can always take ten minutes, we can always dash out after Vespers to turn off the sprinklers on the lawn and then dash back in again. <laughs> and uh, little things like that. But so it's necessary to be industrious in preserving I empty times in which more inward operations become paramount. One of the interesting things I remember reading once was a study in, in business administration on, on executives. Difference between creative executives and non-creative executives. They found that there were four types of tasks. There were tasks which were urgent and important. No problem with those. Everybody did them. There were tasks which were not urgent and not important. No problem with those. Nobody did them. But the big difference they found between creative executives and uncreative executives, people who are just filling in their day and not really giving any leadership or direction to their departments, was that creative executives did things that were important even though they weren't urgent. Whereas people who are uncreative simply did what was urgent, did what was urgent and not important. A telephone rings, they'd answer it. A crisis comes up, they'd deal with it. But always urgency to urgency to urgency. But the problem is that no time was left for the really important things. And so they, they began to say, to be a good executive, you must be able to distinguish between what is urgent but not important and, and important but not urgent. And so a thing like turning off the sprinklers on the lawn or, or getting the laundry going or cooking the meal, all of those are urgent. They're important to some extent, but they're not absolutely important. We could have done them at another time. But a thing like Lexio Divina, it's certainly important, but it's not urgent. It doesn't matter whether you do it today or yesterday or, or Tuesday week or prayer or, or scope for, for reflection in life. And so often, if we're not living a very creative life, we allow ourselves to be governed by urgencies or imagined urgencies. We go from crisis to crisis. And we feel very bad about our life because constantly our decisions are not coming from ourselves. They're not paralleled with the fundamental purpose of our life, but simply dictated by things outside, like the telephone. We run to the telephone, the front doorbell, run to the... Well, somebody, some people are, are the, officially like that. 
but we can live our life just dealing with urgencies and never really looking at the fundamental thing of, of our life. And again, here is the time to examine ourselves. Do we, you know, have we spent time on any important things lately? Or do we just simply do jobs as they come up? Are we really trying to deepen our understanding of who we are, our understanding of where we stand before God, and where, we, where God is calling us to go at the present, or are we just dealing with daily jobs? So, it's necessary to be industrious in preserving empty times. And sometimes it's, 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 it's enough just to decide to finish work at a time, and not to say what you're going to do there, but you're just going to spend half an hour, 35, 40 minutes, whatever it is before Vespers, just to be open to what seems to be uh, God calls me to do at a particular time, to pray, to read, to be reflective. It's kind of quiet time or holy time without trying to mastermind it, but just to uh, allow myself just some spiritual openness so that time can get at it. In this text, he says in 58.1, take note of the things I have spoken to you about more than once. So I'm not the only one who repeats myself. Bernard does also. I'm speaking of the interchange between holy quiet and necessary action. The two things that should fill our life, holy quiet, quiet dedicated to God, and necessary action. Of the fact that there is never in this life enough scope for contemplation nor is our time of holy leisure of sufficient length, since the more pressing usefulness of duties and tasks keeps us on the move. So we've got to try and make as much space as we can, not to mastermind it, but just to leave ourselves free to the inspiration of grace and of the moment. Therefore, we have to be particularly careful to exploit our situation for the possibilities that it offers, and to make use of seasons of quiet to build up reserves which will sustain us in busy times. And this is where we come across a, a very strong theme in the sermons of St. Augustine, where he repeatedly tells us to imitate the ant. And he says, what does the ant do during the summer? It spends the time storing up uh, food for the winter. So that winter when winter comes, uh, it's got enough food to last a, a long time. And he's saying it's the same with us. When, when the going is good, then, uh, and our spiritual life is sort of flitting along, and we don't have that many difficulties or troubles or occupations or demands on our time, or the sort of job that gets us involved with inner conflicts, that brings all our inner conflicts to the fore. Well, he says, during that time, gorge yourself. Make a pig of yourself. <laughs> you know, really give yourself to all the spiritual activity you can. Because... It's summertime, and you need to store up enough food for the winter. Uh, and if you're going to spend the summertime down the beach and fooling around and saying, I don't need much to survive, then winter comes, you're left with nothing. And he says very, very interestingly that when the winter comes, it's equally hard on everyone. You know, when the bad days come, we all experience it. But the only ones who survive, or survival, depends not on what you do during the winter, but what you do, what you did do during the summer. Now, when you had the opportunity, did you use it to, to like the camel, build up your hump, build up uh, your, your kind of reserve of, of prayer and, uh, and reading and, and reflection? Or did you say, oh, I can survive with relatively little and do nothing at all? And this is, this is the theme that there are times in life in which prayer comes relatively simply. We're able to, we feel called to it, come simply, but it still needs that, that element of fidelity to respond to it, because the season will change and prayer may become very difficult, we may get a new job, we may get uh, an occupation which so destroys our peace of mind that prayer becomes very difficult altogether. So make a pig of yourself while you can, because you won't always be able to, to, to have the opportunities that you have now. That's what, what, what he's saying to us. Uh, in effect. My own abbot has a theory that very often it happens that people get great graces of prayer um, at a time before <laughs> um, something happens which, which, which is a challenge to them. 
and in the sense that if they correspond, if they say, oh no, I'll just keep to my normal course and don't correspond to these special graces, then uh, when the difficult time comes, they're caught short-changed. But these graces of prayer are given to them in order to build up their strength so that when difficult times comes and extraordinary challenges or they get a new job or they're made abbot or something like that, then all of a sudden, at least for the first uh, few years, they've got something to live off. They've got a reserve on which they can draw. That's why this whole idea of alternation is a very challenging one. On the one hand, it sounds good to say everybody in the community is different, but it's not a let out. It doesn't mean to say I can put up my feet and take it easy and just be myself, but it says each one of us has got to face the challenge of not, not, not only doing less than the community, but of being doing more than the community when we're called to, because we may need it later on. But I think that's about time now, so in the next session we'll just finish off this, and then uh, if anybody wants to bring up some points of discussion, I'm sure we'd all appreciate it.